Welcome to the O Show. I'm Laura Babcock. And with a big new city budget passed, tax increase, and no strategic meeting yet by council to set their priorities, we have to ask the question that Graham Crawford brought up on the last O Show, which is, are we city building? Are we making strategic investments that we need for the future? And where is the mayor's leadership? on some major issues to that end, like stopping Doug Ford and his expansion into the green belt and protecting our urban boundary, and on LRT, which is a huge once in a generational project. Where is the mayor's leadership? What is council doing? Are we city building or are we just slowing down the management of our decline with this new council? Fascinating conversations coming up with environmental expert and former journalist, Mark Cripps, and with Chris Ritzma, who is an active transportation advocate all on our new cycling infrastructure. You won't want to miss this though, show. Do you think the new city council is setting strategic priorities and city building, or do you think that they are sort of spending their way and continuing to manage our decline as a city? I yet to see anything kind of strategic in their thinking. I mean, I think the first big test for me will be how they handle the urban boundary expansion issue and will they stand up uh, as they were, you know, as the citizens have asked them to do and they stood up and, you know, it harkens back to the, to the debate over the urban boundary where I was kind of feeling like a lot of people were just saying, you know, okay, we won't expand the urban boundary because it won't matter because A, I'm not running again or B, the government will just force us to do it. So it'll be on them. I'm looking for leadership on this issue. And I think, you know, it starts <clears throat> with getting serious about the development permits that the city is claiming or the, the available space that the city is claiming is available right now for development. That is a little bit untrue. And I think they need to start working uh, feverishly to get some of this, uh, some of these um, so-called, uh, you know, um, development proposals into actually you know, the draft plan stage, a lot of them are just numbers. And, you know, I feel like at the end of the day, like this is going to be the, the straw that breaks the camel's back in terms of how the government, the provincial government will just start mandating and overriding it. I mean, yeah, this is a big issue. And, you know, do you, you know, what's the negotiation play here? Like, do you have to play nice? You have to allow the province to do what they want to do in terms of expanding the urban boundary, in terms of building into the green space uh, at the risk of not getting funding for something else. Like this, it's a really weird and strange dynamic right now. And especially when you have, you know, the former leader of the opposition um, as, as the mayor of the city. So for me, that's the big first test. Uh, you know, what are they gonna do on that? This is, you know. Uh, well, do you uh, think that Andrea Horvath is passing or failing because she was noticeably absent from some of those green belt protests where other city councillors like Danko and, and Craig Kassar and many others were in attendance and leading. And when there was a huge one at our city hall, the mayor of Burlington was there, but Andrea Horvath was missing in action. So what what is your grade on how she's handling this delicate situation so far? Seems to me that she's getting a lot of advice from whoever, uh, the circle around her to sort of stay low key, stay below the radar. In terms of the whole thrust behind, you know, changing the old guard and, and building a new council, this it, it's it's really disappointing to see somebody start out of the gate like that, especially when you know, it, it seemed like this was just sort of, uh, oh, well, you know, I, I need a job, so I'll run for mayor because, you know, and, 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 and maybe the fact that, you know, Keenan did so well, uh, Keenan Loomis did so well, and, and she almost narrowly, like, defeated him, yeah. you know, has given her some pause for, you know, how quickly she's out of the gate. Uh, maybe she's finding her footing, but that seems awfully weird for somebody who spent so many years you know, raging and pounding her fists on the desk in Queens Park and, you know, taking all of these sort of real high level advocacy positions to all of a sudden go silent and be no. 
So I'm. And so, I mean, you, you, of course, have been part of the Osho community team for a long time. And you saw the interview that I did with Andrea Horvath, that one on one where I, I started to feel concern that there wasn't a lot of vision and a lot of energy for the position. And, you know, it was more of a just taking it because she could have it kind of a vibe. And I would think losing to Keenan by 1% in that nail biter election, uh, that she would come out of the gate strong and say, hey, listen, Hamilton, you might have questioned how much I'm into this thing, but let's go, right? And one of the easiest things would have been the green belt. Yeah. Because there are mayors across Ontario who are standing up strong to this premier about it. So there was a natural coalition where Andrea Horvath could have been a part, but she didn't even show up. And then on her Twitter feed, which doesn't tweet a lot, so it's notable when she does, she tweets from a home builders meeting she was at. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they were the same group that kind of ran a, a campaign for urban boundary expansion. And uh, I'm shaking, am I am I wrong on that, Mark? And, and what what do you make of that last week? I, I can't figure it out. Is she for the urban boundary expansion now? I don't get it. I, I, <laughs> that's really, I wish she would answer that question I, I, unequivocally. I wish someone would ask her that. I, and maybe the media is failing a little bit and holding her to account on, as the leader of this city, you know, what position are you going to take on this issue because it's it's extremely important to a lot of people who are very passionate about this um it's also very important to the future of our city to the future of our farmland you know um it it, it just like i'm I, I was expecting her as someone who i watched in queen's park you know i worked in queen's park for eight years um watching her every day you know speaking to what i thought was with passion uh on issues that were concerned to her to come out of the gate like so flat, especially when this is the issue that everyone's talking about at the municipal level. And, you know, it's sort of like, um, it's sort of like Mike Harris all over again with this sort of the way the province is sort of deciding to work or not work with municipalities um, and sort of take a heavy handed approach to how they're um, going to work with municipalities. And, Personally, I would think, um, you know, Andrea has spoken at AMO. Andrea has spoken at Roma. She's spoken passionately about the, the role of municipalities. You know, they need to be respected. And, and, and so I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe she's got a grand plan that we don't know. And she's working behind the scenes. I have no idea. But at the end of the day, like, you know, she does need to be um, a role, you know, the figurehead for the city. She does need to avoid being too outwardly emotional about issues um, so that she can be objective. But this one seems like a no brainer in terms of her philosophy, uh, her ideology, and the fact that, you know, the city as a whole, in, in most part, majority of citizens are really concerned about this issue and don't want to see um, our, our urban boundary um, change. It's been absolutely bizarre. Um, there was a, someone who wrote, I believe it was Rob Howard, or I, I might have got his name long, wrong, but wrote a letter to the editor last week about where is Andrea after 100 days? Where is her vision? Where is her messaging? Like, what is she doing as mayor? Uh, and that letter, when I posted it, got tremendous response because people, even if they voted for her, are like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. LRT is a once in a generation, multi billion dollar project coming. There are all kinds of businesses and people affected about that. Where is the mayor on that? Where's her leadership? I don't believe that working behind the scenes uh, is the job of a mayor. Fine, if you set your priorities, your vision, you communicate it once and then you say, let me do my work. Great. But we're still waiting to hear what it is she's working on uh, and why she wasn't at these Greenbelt things. So I hope, Mark, and speaking, you know, in your journalism hat here, uh, she's all, Andrea Horvath, Mayor Horvath, you are always welcome on the O Show. I, I doubt you'll come back on, but if you do, I will ask you the same questions I would if Keenan came back on the program if he'd won as mayor. And one of them is, where do you stand on the Greenbelt? What are you doing about it? 
what kind of leadership can council and the public get behind on protecting our precious urban boundary for the densification? Where are we with the LRT? What is your office doing to make sure that we're mitigating some of those disruptions and we're communicating effectively to, to the people who are impacted so that we can make this project happen well and have the kind of mixed affordable and deeply affordable housing along the route and that we need? I mean, this is the time for leaders to speak and to step up. So those are my questions to Mayor Horvath. Her team can answer me any way they like on Twitter or anywhere else. Um, but I hope the other media asks her about that too, instead of just how happy she is about, you know, the Thai cat season opener or some, some other <laughs> ludicrous question. <laughs> okay, Mark, uh, any other comments before I let you go? We saw last week, I believe it was last week where the um, uh, Minister Clark announced um, uh, rapid approval for uh, residential obstruction on farmland, which was uh, which was more of a, a rural play. So, which you know sends another signal about farmland and and how we are considering it in terms of uh, a resource that can only be you know built upon once when you build houses. You know, um, I, I I feel like the government is is somewhat overplaying their hand, and maybe it could be like a heavy handed approach to get to some kind of compromise. We do need to build housing. You know, accountability, accountability officer, somebody re released a report recently saying that they, there's no way the government's going to build 1.5 million homes right. in 10 years. Um, they can't even build as many homes this year as they have in previous years because there's no, like the, the shortage of construction workers, trades, the cost of supplies. You know, I've talked to some people in the development community who say that developers are just simply putting developments on hold. They, because it just, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't make financial sense. And I would just warn and, and remind people that no bank and no insurance company or anybody, or no, no one's going to insure a development that's built in a floodplain or built in a high risk area that they, that no builder is going to receive the funding. They're not going to self finance it. So we need to, you know, Remember that, you know, again, any infringement upon the green belt is, is just ridiculous to begin with because we don't need to. But rest assured that, you know, there will there always is this um, extra level of scrutiny. And what the federal government is doing on the Dufferin Rouge um, uh, study, I think, is, you know, a bit of a curveball for the for the government. And, and you know, who knows um, where they go with this. But I, I, I do I do admire their tenacity to get homes built, but the philosophy of sort of supporting the urban sprawl mechanism for that is is questionable considering all of the studies that have been done in the last 10 years on, you know, intensity and densification, the cost of sprawl, the long-term cost of sprawl to taxpayers. So I hope they, you know, I, I do agree that they need to work, they need to get municipalities off their butts yeah. and get, you know, get stuff to to draft approval, get stuff built. Everybody talks a big game and then they, you know, wallow in the NIMBY, uh, uh, you know, election cycle where they're worried one group is like, I don't want that apartment here. Well, I better worry about those five votes. You know, it's, it's we, municipalities have been doing this for way too long. And I give the government credit for sort of bringing down a little bit of a hammer uh, on that um, process. So when we talk about Hamilton, we want to build inside the urban boundary get the stuff into draft proposals. You can't build if it's not in a draft submission. It's one thing to say we have the numbers. It's another thing to get them built. Well, it's great tactical advice, Mark. And it, you brought to mind for me, I, I'm so glad that Councillor Nan and Councillor Kretsch figured out how to retrofit those 400 plus affordable housing units already within supply exactly mm -hmm. and save money because I think it probably circumvents some of those other bottleneck issues that you were discussing around pricing and, and access to materials and everything else. I mean, mm -hmm. let's fix up what we got yeah. uh, and get them out there. And along the LRT, you know, that deeply affordable and mixed housing use and the builds, what are they going to look like? I'm with you. We have to build. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but unlike what Ford said, you know, end of discussion. No, no, actually, yeah. we need to have the discussion because the municipalities were asked by the government to come up with all the ways to build and to meet the housing targets. And then the government kind of saw it and said, yeah, whatever, we're taking the green belt. Right. So, I mean, they're. Uh, 
they have to make any case they make to take that land when there's other land available for densification. Yeah. Um, but I'm 100% with you as well. We can't, you know, um, speak out of both sides of our mouth here. We can't scream and yell for housing and affordable housing. And then as soon as there's one put up near us, we say, no, no, not that kind, not in my neighborhood, right? Um, we all have to do whatever it takes to create the kind of housing opportunities for people in Ontario and people in Hamilton. You saw the housing special, I'm sure uh, that the O Show did, Mark. Yeah. People are in desperate straits yeah. for affordable housing and for yeah. rental properties and for multiple family dwellings. So some of that might be Ford's Greenbelt houses. I hope not, um, oh. but there's so much more that we need that we can do that we all have to work together on. So I, I love that you always bring us back to uh, reality. Well, one thing I'll just end with, which is so important, but let's remember that when Hamilton stood up and and said no to the urban boundary expansion, it created a ripple effect upon around municipalities all around the Greater Golden Horseshoe. We were sort of like the leader, mm -hmm. and you know, it's it's easy to pick off one municipality who's going rogue, but if you show leadership and then you have that leadership spread again, where people are just saying, "Look, no, no." I think the problem is going to have a hard time bringing down the hammer on a whole bunch of municipalities without political consequences. That is the only strength that we have. And I was having a, a raucous debate on more in the morning this past week about, you know, just the issue around homelessness and mental health and what's happening yeah. with violence in, in the transit in Toronto and everything else. And we need municipalities working together to get the province to the table. We need to collaborate. These issues are bigger than any one city. And we need, to your point earlier, Mayor Andrea Horvath to do what she's distinguished herself as being able to do the last 15 years, get in front of a bloody microphone and show some leadership and get people riled up to support working with other municipalities for affordable housing and for protecting our green belt, things that I believe she stands for. So thank you so much, Mark, for thank doing you, Mark. the show. Recently, there was some good news from the new council in terms of Councillor Wang's motion that was approved to speed up the cycling infrastructure that was going to happen in Hamilton, but over a long, long period of time. Now it's going to happen a little more quickly. Is this to you a sign that council understands the importance for city building? Uh, or do you think this is kind of a, a one-off by Councillor Wang? Where do you see this new council in terms of their vision for the future and how fast they're acting towards that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think the new council is a strong mandate by, by citizens uh, to uh, you know, indicate that there's interest in, in moving Hamilton forward. Uh, we've had a lot of stagnation at council. And so I, I, I hope to, I hope that this is the beginning of a, uh, of a new city building uh, council that looks to the future and, and makes strategic investments in, you know, historically underfunded uh, aspects of city building and, and stops that, you know, continuous de deficit and just moving and deferring things forward. Right. The kicking it down the can, the can down the road that we saw so often from the old guard on council. Uh, and some people are smarting at the size of this tax increase for Hamiltonians. Uh, myself, I thought it was long overdue. It was politically expedient to keep it at zero tax increase. But all we were doing was deferring things we had to pay for. And so I think this is partly an inflation budgetary increase. It's partly based around the fact that we're, we're kind of catching up on stuff in the past, but where I'm interested in getting more thoughts from you on the idea of city building and making strategic investments for the future. The cycling one seems indicative of that. Are you seeing anything else, Chris, that is giving you a sense that the new council, to your point, is really getting on with city building uh, and we're, we're getting out of that stagnation decade or, or generation? Yeah, I mean, uh, not just cycling, but uh, there's been a lot of conversations around transit, around uh, maintenance of, of infrastructure. Uh, e even as a cycling and transit advocate, I, uh, you know, I, I see the roads, I, I bike on the roads. And, and so I've seen that they've been working on improving the, the historic pothole issue that, that ha plagues Hamilton. Um, and I, I think that those, uh, you know, smart investments in maintaining our infrastructure is really key to eventual not not eventually not having such high uh, tax increases because really you know it's it's penny wise pound foolish uh, historically and we've seen a lot of issues where things just you know break I mean this winter I don't know if it's just me but it seems like there's been a lot more sewer main breaks 
And, uh, you know, it, it's not just an inconvenience, but it's also, it's also really expensive to have contractors out there every single week, fixing issues, fixing bike lanes, fixing roads, fixing transit to vehicles that are, are falling apart. It's, it's just, you know, it's going to, we're going to continue to see those types of, of, of high ta property taxes if we don't invest now and stop the, you know, the bleeding of, of our infrastructure. Well, and yeah, I mean, it's an excellent point uh, on bike lanes and I'm hoping that you can <laughs> lend your expertise towards this because this drives me absolutely crazy. So I don't know if you ever go up near the Meadowlands, but I do do a fair bit of shopping up in that, that plaza in Ancaster. And when you are leaving the Meadowlands and you're heading towards the option to go to Mohawk Road to get on the link in Alexander or to get on the 403 towards Toronto, there are multiple lanes of cars that are literally crossing in the intersection and across a bike lane, just a painted bike lane. I am afraid to even drive that area. I could not imagine possibly being a cyclist going through that bike lane through all of those ingresses and egresses from the highways it makes no sense to me so chris why would a city ever do that put a bike lane like that there just a painted lane in the middle of all that kind of traffic chaos and is it representative of a past perception of oh we have to do these cycling lanes because we're being told to but we really don't care about safe cycling infrastructure like who's ever going to use that bloody thing maybe you have but I, I would never put my life on the line i have not i've i've used similar infrastructure and, and it is it is scary um and it's <clears throat> you know i'm a cycling advocate but not to the point of wanting to die on the road or or get seriously injured on the road um you know when it comes to those types of bike lanes i think there's you know, two big reasons that they exist. One is that for the most part, cycling is seen by even, you know, even still today by as largely a recreational activity. They see people in Lycra with, uh, you know, really fast bikes and they think, well, you know, we're, what we're doing is we're giving space to them, right? Rather than thinking about safe infrastructure. And then, yeah, the second thing is just that they felt that they had to do it. Uh, and, uh, and they said, well, look now, you know, now there's a bike lane. And, you know, there's no idea why nobody's using it is you know, because it's uncomfortable. It's unsafe. Uh, if they put a sidewalk in the middle of the 403 uh, with no barriers, I don't think people would walk there either, especially not with their children, um, because people value their lives. They value their safety and they value their comfort when they're when they're moving around. My 12 year old daughter, Matisse, saw it and she said, Mom, whoever made that bike lane must hate cyclists. <laughs> you know, cause, yeah. uh, I mean, I don't want to ascribe that kind of um, motive to city planners, but it looked like it was done because they were told to do it, but not done with the intention of ever having anyone use it safely. And, and I don't think that that's the way that you city build. So I'm curious, Chris, do you have hope that in the expediting of the cycling infrastructure that we're going to see the kind of separated safe bike lanes that we see like for instance on richmond street in toronto and other places where there's tons of cycling traffic they move faster than the vehicle traffic and they are safe behind these beautiful flower boxes i mean are we going to see that in hamilton yeah i mean i i look forward to to seeing that type of thing happening i've been seeing it happening i've been talking with staff about this and their goal has been to uh, you know, when, when bike infrastructure is going in to do it right or mostly right the first time. And, you know, with anything, this is largely a retrofitting of old infrastructure, right? These are roads that were built too wide in the first place, you know, which is to our benefit because there's room for a painted bike lane, but a painted bike lane isn't good enough. And when the road is reconstructed, I hope to see improved infrastructure. The worst is when you see, like we've seen kind of a little bit on, almost botched on Cannon Street where they redid the road, but then didn't properly put in a, a, a protected bike lane. I, I don't want to see that happening in the future. If we're going to redo the road, uh, we need to put in proper infrastructure. And that's how other cycling, you know, meccas have done it. I mean, the Netherlands had painted bike lanes when they first put in their bike lanes. And then when the road was rebuilt, they went back and they did it correctly. And so the worst thing we can do is, is just have a, uh, a painted bike lane when the road is repaved or reconstructed um, and, and leave it like that for another 30 years, because you know, the 10 or 15 years we've had it isn't good enough. And then to, to say, you know, but if we repave it with another painted bike lane, it, it's a really strong statement that this isn't important. So we need to see it improved. It's amazing when you, we always think the Netherlands as being the place that has these incredible 
bike infrastructure. And to your point, they started with the painted and then they realized how to do it well. In Hamilton, we don't have to go back to what they were doing 30 years ago. We can actually, as you say, learn their best practice from all these years and see what they're doing. And you posted a tweet, you retweeted something from Brent Toder on the, uh, the urban planner who's always posting this great stuff. And it was of a park in, I believe, Vancouver, where you saw the LRT going by and you saw the, the, the cyclists using their bike infrastructure. And it just looked like something that you know we see in New York City or we see in Europe, but we don't see in Canada. But yet they're doing it in other Canadian municipality. So, so does that give you hope that you know other Canadian cities are learning and doing it right? Yeah, I mean, I I'm I, maybe I'm overly optimistic, but I I like I like the, what I'm seeing. That that tweet that you're mentioning it reminded me almost like of a of like a futuristic city where people got around easily and comfortably. Uh, people felt safe and were able to play with their children. Uh, you know, I, I think people just want to get around. And you look at these futuristic cities, you think of like something like Epcot or Tomorrowland, and you think, well, that's not possible. We can't do that. But, we, you know, we can and we we have and we will if we have the political will to do it. Uh, we just need to actually, you know, push for it as citizens. And we need to understand that, you know, there's other options to get around our city. And, and you know, when they put into bike lanes on Cannon and Bay Street, just the other day over the weekend, I saw tons of families getting around by bike in the bike lanes that do exist in the lower city where near where I live. People want to get around these ways. <clears throat> and it's not just for, you know, wealthy neighborhoods either. It needs to be all neighborhoods because, it, you know, equity is incredibly important. And some people don't even have a choice as to whether they drive or ride a bike. Some people have to ride a bike because they don't have the money to, to you know, own a car because car ownership is expensive. And so we need to give options to those people, especially because, you know, they don't have a choice and, and they're not some sort of sacrifice population because, you know, they're not the, ni the, the nicer neighborhood that uh, is, is worth investing in. It, it absolutely is. And it, those are the most important neighborhoods, if anything. I love your point about equity. And, and so what do you think about the new scooters? that came out you're for active transportation i don't know if they qualify because they're e by I, I believe they have a motor on them um but some have said they're they're cost prohibitive for some people to use so what's your thought on that new program that was just launched yeah i mean if if uh, you've spoken to anyone that i know personally uh it i've been critical of the e-scooters for a few different reasons um i they are cost prohibitive uh to a certain degree and and hamilton uh, bike share of for which i'm a board member of is uh is you know not only is affordable and provides an equity program that really aims to to provide uh, mobility to those who who can't afford a typical uh, membership, but the the e scooters are expensive. I the problem the big issue with with uh, any type of transportation uh, is that you know nobody can or wants to pay the full cost, and you know even our roads are subsidized by. Uh, property tax owners and and it's not like just because you can ride drive on the road for free doesn't mean they are free they're subsidized uh, similar to our transit similar to our other mobility options and and scooter share is not subsidized and so when you see that full upfront cost you're it, it looks it's a it's a heavy price tag but I would bet that if people had to pay the full upfront cost of driving every single day um, you know as, as like a, a cash payment or a credit card payment uh, they would see how expensive it is and they would maybe look at ways to reduce their car dependency, uh, whether it's driving less or completely ditching their car. So while scooters are expensive, I do think there may be a, a little bit of a niche for fun rides here and there, uh, maybe last mile connections, uh, but similar to bike share. Uh, but I, I do think they're a little bit more expensive and they're a little bit maybe less uh, uh, friendly to people with, with disabilities because uh, there's, you know, I, I know some people with disabilities who, who ride bikes and can ride bikes much faster than they walk and standing on a scooter for multiple minutes, especially on our Hamilton roads, seems like it would, might be a little rough, but uh, I'm happy to see them overall. So, you know, Nashville has them when we thought they were kind of cool there, but Nashville has very big, wide pavement areas for <laughs> them. Paris is looking at banning them, I believe, because of the pedestrians who are hit uh, on when, and they, I think they only ride them down the street in Paris. They can't even take them on the sidewalks, but they're having issues. So it's a mixed bag. We'll have to see how it goes, but I'm so pleased to have you back on the program yeah. Chris, for all of your insight into this. I'm one of those people who really wants to ditch the car <laughs> between cycling infrastructure and the ability to afford Ubers when I need them. Uh, I, I'd love to get to that place uh, as well at some point, but we need to be city building to give everyone 
equitable opportunities to have alternative modes of transportation and to get more active. So we'll keep and working. car share too. Car share. Yeah. Car share is a great op car share is a great option too. It you know cars are going to always be a part of it, but car share is a great option as well. So I I hope to see more of that as well. I love what you just said. It's not a war on the car. It's an opportunity yeah. for more access for everybody to different and healthier yes. modes of transportation. Well said, Chris. Thanks so much for being on the O Show, and thank you for watching. Thank you. And please subscribe on YouTube if you haven't already, and we'll keep bringing you the great content. Thanks so much. Take care.